helpful. I, I don't believe the updates are helpful to counties. Um, but we've also been meeting with members of the legislature, working with legislative attorneys and our own attorneys at Bob Breeson um, to really discuss some of the, the issues at play and what our options are. So I think what we hope to do today is update you on the, the current state of affairs with the Census Bureau, as well as outline uh, what we see to be the, the timelines associated with, with redistricting and they lay out some options. As always, we're, we're incredibly interested in your feedback um, any information that you can share with us to make sure that we're as informed as we possibly can be when we as we move forward. Um, so with that, you can always uh, type a question in the, the chat or Q&A. And then if you'd like to speak, you can also use the raised hand function. Chelsea will make sure that you're um, unmuted and, and can ask your question or make your comment. So with that, I'll turn over to our general counsel, Andy Phillips, to kind of uh, set the stage uh, on where we're at and where we think we're probably going. Andy? Thank you, Kyle, and good afternoon, everybody. As Kyle mentioned, this is an incredibly important topic for everybody. So let's make sure we want to have a solid understanding before we start working on potential solutions here of exactly what the practical and real impacts of what it is that's being proposed here, how it's going to work. Um, as Kyle mentioned, with the release delayed to September 30, there is just no way that we can get redistricting done in time for the December 1st period for nomination paper circulation to begin. I know uh, the date is actually sooner than that because of publication requirements. So it's actually by, done by the end of November. So trying to get this done in 45 days um, is impossible given the current statutory requirements on public hearings and notice surrounding the three phases of the process. So that gets us to the point of taking a look at options surrounding delay of the redistricting process and what that looks like. Of course, if we delay the redistricting process, that is going to impact the elections for next spring, spring of 2022. We all know that county board members are up for election spring of 2022. So we have to look at a redistricting process that will take, take place next year, but it won't take effect, so to speak, until 2024 elections. We also then have to worry about the legislative redistricting process that the state undergoes. And we also have to worry about municipal process because municipalities, they have elections more than once every two years. And so they have to redraw their ward lines. When will that take effect? And so what we've done is chart out what we think could be a solution here as it relates to delay. And I'll share my screen here so you can see what that option looks like. Kyle, Marcy, Ben, is that up on the screen now? It is, Andy. So if we look at the key dates and proposed timeline, and again, this means public information isn't on the census isn't available till September 30. This is just, again, one option that we took a look at. What does it look like if we, uh, we push the dates back? Well, we received the data on September 30. Let's just assume that happens. We get it on September 30. We know that on November 23rd, we have to publish a notice for the spring 2022 elections. Candidates start taking out papers December 1, 2021. And then we have this period here where after receipt of the data on September 30, we would need to complete phase one of the redistricting process by February 28th. So we would have from October 1st through February 28th to come up with our county tentative plan. As you recall, that tentative plan gets transmitted to the municipalities. So immediately on March 1st, municipalities begin phase two. And let me note that that's a deadline. It's not a hard date. So when we say the deadline is February 28th, if you transmit to the municipalities on February 15th, that's fine. The municipalities can start then, that's fine. We're just saying that as a drop dead date, the municipalities would have to begin their phase of redistricting, redrawing the ward lines on March 1st. Now, there is a deadline for completion of legislative redistricting that's baked into this process. The reason it's baked into this process is that the legislature is going to have and the state is going to have their elections in 2022 as well. So we have to have the ward lines and the redistricting done in time for the fall 2022 state elections so that they can go ahead and proceed with their elections. And we have our supervisory districts and municipal ward lines drawn so that we know from a clerk and a municipal perspective where people need to go to vote, 
for a particular legislator or candidate. So again, back to this, we have the deadline for completion of legislative redistricting, April 1. April 5 election, as I mentioned, that would use the current districts and wards, the ones that have been drawn since the 2010 census, all right? That was, that's what would prevail for the 2022 spring election. April 11, 2022, that's where for the fall general elections using the new state redistricting guidelines, they would publish their type A notice to let candidates know where the boundaries are and eligibility to run for office. And then we have nomination papers taken out for that fall general election on April 15. By May 15, that's the deadlines for the municipalities to complete phase two. Remember we had that started in March. So we go through March, go through April, go through half of May, we get to May 15, that's the deadline for the municipalities to come up with their plan and transmit it back to the counties. The new lines for the municipal wards would be effective in spring of 2023 for municipal elections. But again, those new wards take effect for the, for the fall elections uh, for the state in the fall of 2022. After we get the information from the municipal, we can begin phase three. Again, we have 6-1 in there as a date. We should have probably made it May 15, but you can really start in the process for adopting the final plan upon receipt of the municipality's plan. We have June 12 in there where ballots are printed for the fall general election using again, the new municipal wards. And then finally, on August 1st, that's the drop dead date for counties to complete phase three, which is adoption of the final plan. And then that final plan waits a period of about 16 months to take effect, meaning that in December of 2023, candidates taking out papers for county supervisor districts are taking out papers for the new districts. And those new districts are elected in the spring of 2024. So that's what we were looking at in terms of a potential fix if we were to bump those dates out because it's not as simple as simply delaying by a few months to account for the delay in the release of the census data. The waterfall effect, if you will, associated with moving that date requires us to think about perhaps running the 2022 elections on the current 2010 census data and then have new districts be impacted um, in the 2024 elections. So maybe I'll turn it back to Kyle and Marcy if there's additional color that you want to provide to the thought process on these new dates and plans. Yeah, Andy, can you speak to, so I think with the September, the new, you know, September 30 release from Census Bureau, um, I'm assuming the vast, vast majority of counties are gonna feel that they can't do this. But can you explain why we feel it's important that all, either all 72, all 72 counties do this in 2021 or all 72 counties delay. Can you explain why we can't kind of have a, a patchwork? Yeah, and I mean, it's more supposition than it is anything else because um, I wasn't around the last time we had a global pandemic that created all sorts of problems with our census data. I don't think Kyle was either, frankly, and I know Marcy wasn't. And so there's not a lot of case law or guidance that we can lean back on and say, well, here's the issue that comes up if we have different counties doing different redistricting at different times. From my perspective, the overriding constitutional principle here when it comes to redistricting, the one that's always going to have impact and if you violate it, it's gonna get you in trouble is the one person, one vote concept. So if you've got a group of 10 people represented by one county supervisor over here, you can't have a group of 3000 represented by one supervisor over here. Constitutionally, we have to come as close as we can to one person, one vote. The concern is, is that if we have one county redistricting in a hurry in time for the spring 2022 elections, they may have, they may have better constitutional represent, representation than the neighboring county. And we don't want to give rise to any sort of lawsuit, whether it be by a citizen group or otherwise, suggesting that somehow a county is out of compliance because if that county would have acted like the neighboring county in quick 
getting through the redistricting process, then we would have one person, one vote, and we don't. So that's a problem. So from a legal perspective, the more uniformity we have with all 72 counties, I think the more defensible it is as a position and the less likely we are to get some sort of litigation challenge. The other thing beyond the citizen and constitutional angle is that remember we've got the state process that's baked into this, okay? What, what would happen is that if we draw our supervisory districts, municipalities draw their wards, state then draws its plan. If the state splits a municipal ward, it goes back to the muni and the muni has to figure out a way to deal with it and we have to amend our final plan. In this circumstance, we wait for the state to go first and then we have the information. We don't have that back and forth that could happen thereby impacting uh, the situation with the elections. And in a compressed time frame, having to deal with the impact of that would be incredibly difficult. So those are the two primary reasons, Kyle, that we're trying to figure out a way to try to create uniformity here throughout the state. You know, Andy, and the other item that I probably should have mentioned is that, you know, this is kind of our initial proposal to, to get your feedback from the membership. Um, but ultimately, in order for anything to change, we do need state law changes, right? We need a statutory change. Um, and, and so that's either gonna have to, you know, happen in the state budget or in separate legislation. So this isn't as easy as, or as simple as us just deciding, okay, here's the plan that, that we should use going forward. This is what we're going to do. We do need a law change. So on that front, as I mentioned, we have met with legislative leadership and, and at least briefed them and, and made them aware of this issue. Um, today, I believe at two o'clock or 2.30, Marcy, uh, we're meeting with the governor's office as well to, to brief them um, on this. So um, again, I think, I think we're still kind of at the information gathering stage here. And that's why I'm, I'm hoping that, that the folks on this call will provide us, will provide us feedback. But again, what, whatever happens will be contingent on what we can get the legislature and ultimately the governor to agree to and, and sign into law. Marcy, did you have anything to, to add? No, I think you guys covered all of it, other than I would just add that we continue to um, keep an open line of communications with the legislative um, body and hopes of, you know, um, getting something passed, so. I see we do have a few questions, a few questions from Wendy in Racine County. Has this timeline been checked with the Wisconsin Elections Commission to make sure the new ward data can be loaded in time to be implemented for the fall 2022 elections? Um, Wendy, we have not spoken with the Elections Commission yet. I, I will tell you that um, Senator Bernier is very interested in, in assisting us with this and she was going to reach out to the Elections Commission. I know we have a meeting with her early next week so we can follow up uh, with you on that, Wendy, directly. And then Kara from Outagamie, Andy has a question. Can you explain again why counties aren't starting until January 1st of 2022? Well, you mean in, in terms of the tentative plan, I assume there's no, there's no start date. You don't have to delay starting the redistricting process to come up with a tentative plan. You can do that as soon as you get the census data. The important part is that no matter when that tentative plan is done, gets transmitted to the municipalities, the municipalities, the counties, we can't have a final plan that gets implemented until um, it would be, I guess, August 1st to make sure that we don't have it in time for the spring 2022 election. So, I mean, there's no, there's no real reason for a delay to January 1. That's just something you could wait until January 1. If that's when you wanted to start with the tentative plan, you could also start on October 1st, assuming we have the data on September 30th, if that's what you want to do. Andy, I see we have another question from Bob Keeney. Is now the time for self-organized counties, maybe all, to consider staggering election of supervisors? I was gonna make a pithy comment about maybe you should ask your clerk about how they feel on running elections every spring. But I think that's the real consideration. That's another set of elections you have to run every single year. I think Bob is right. Well, I know Bob is right. Under 5910, you have the ability to self-organize. And I think we have 48 counties that are self-organized right now. And when you self-organize, you have the ability to stagger terms. And so you could have half the county board elected in odd number of years and half the county board elected in even number of years, if that's what you want to do. Um, 
but it would require a whole new set of elections. You can, you can do that. I mean, part of the reason that you would want to do that is to ensure continuity of the board. And I think everybody understands and remembers last spring when we were faced with the real prospect of not having county board supervisors throughout the state as if the election uh, had been postponed. Um, speak more of this, Marcy can speak more of this. Um, there is legislation that we've got out there we're working on to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, but I mean, that's certainly an option that counties can look at. I don't think that that would impact what's happening here because there's no way to ensure that all 72 counties stagger. So I don't know that that's a realistic possibility right now. A couple other questions, Andy. Um, will this, uh, will the tentative plan be available online? I assume we're referencing the document that's, that's being shared right now. We will include that um, on our website. Um, so uh, go to wicounties.org to, to see that, that plan. Um, another question, Andy, were there any other alternatives considered on how to approach this from a timeline perspective? Yeah, I think we, I think we looked at the statutes and tried to figure out if there was a way to make the statutes work so that somehow 2022, we could still get our elections in on new districts. Because I mean, let's face it, we're going to be going then four years after 2020 under old supervisory districts. And that's, I mean, that wasn't preferred, obviously. And we didn't see any other way of getting this done this way. Um, I see a question there, what about delaying elections? I mean, certainly you could do that. You could delay elections and I suppose move all of the elections to fall, but then you'd have supervisors that are serving two and a half year terms. And so it would again require adjustment of a whole lot of different statutes in that regard. Um, but that's, that's an option. Um, we thought about that, but I, I think we discarded that pretty early, just given the effects or impact of delaying the election on all sorts of other, other circumstances. Andy, a question from Jerry Iverson. Would it be possible to move up the county districts for completion to January 31st of 2022? This would give the locals time to develop wards and then give the legislature the data. This would give the legislature the time to use local data to set the districts based on uh, local redistricting maps. Yeah, we could do that. I think that, and and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, Marcy, Ben, but I think that the the concern that we had was, well, what if they delay the September 30 release date again? We wanted to try to build in as much leeway as we could because they told us originally not later than July or not earlier than July 30th. Now it's on September 30th. What if they move it to November 30th? And so we wanted to be prepared if that were indeed to happen, but that's certainly a consideration. I think, am I right though, Andy, that there, there's no requirement that the legislature has to follow our, our lines. I mean, there is no, there is none. Right. Well, I, I think that's the challenge there is that even in the event, if we were to try to go first essentially and say, hey, legislature, here's our lines. Um, I, I don't think any of us on this call are overly confident that the legislature would do that. I think they're gonna draw their lines to their own prerogative um, uh, regardless of, of the maps, you know, when we propose our maps. Um, Question, a legal question, Andy, how can you create legislative districts that follow one person, one vote, if you don't have new wards? Well, that gets back to your point, Kyle, about how the legislature does not have to follow our plan. And so the concern there is they have their own process for going through redistricting. They have their own experts and computer models and all of that to ensure one person, one vote. We have our own as well. And so um, it's not there, the ward boundaries uh, do not impact the legislator, the legislature's, um, the legislature's plan. I just have Ben to verify that. That's right, isn't it, Ben? That the legislature is not required to follow the muni plan. Yeah, because you know the problem is if the munis get their wards done and then the legislature draws their lines and they don't line up anyway, then it gets kicked uh, kick back to the munis to redo it anyway. Okay. And Andy, two questions about timeline here. The first is: is the 30, 30, 30 plan, not realistic, advisable. I think the answer is we just, there's not that many days um, right. given the September deadline. I think we're looking at 45 days is, is what we'd have. Right. And then from Bob Kopish, I thought there were 60 days per phase. Why longer times in this proposal? Because we have longer time. We don't have to stick to 60, 60, 60. The reason it was 60, 60, 60 was because of uh, just the way the statute set this up. If we think about a release of the census data in a typical year, in April or May, they said not later than, I think it was what, July 1st, we had to have our county tentative plan. 
and then you just add 60 days onto that and then we're guaranteed to be done by mid-November. Um, and so here we have more time. And so, I mean, we could do, there's nothing stopping a county from immediately upon receipt of the census data on September 30th, beginning the tentative plan process and adopting that and sending it off to the municipalities by mid-November, that's fine. Um, it's just, again, it's not going to be effective for the spring 2022 elections. Um, then a comment or question from, from Jerry. I thought the, the tradition was for the state districts to be based on locals first. This provided a better approach to communities of interest. Jerry, I don't, um, I don't necessarily know the answer to that. I think the answer is that historically that, that is how it was done, but I believe in the last redistricting, the legislature did not wait for, for local governments, but I, I, I'd ask a, a county clerk who is a, a participant here to maybe clarify that if, if they're so uh, willing to. So generally, I, I don't think we've seen, um, at least through the, the questions we've we've received so far, you know, um, Kyle. strong opposition to this. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we had, hey, hey Kyle, Wendy Christensen raised her hand. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes, the last time we had redistricting was under the traditional phase of 30-30-30 that and the legislator legislature was meant to start after that process was finished. They sort of jumped in in the middle and it did alter some ward boundaries and we did work with our municipalities and our county plan to adjust all of that. However, it did create some things. Uh, we have, for instance, a ward that is a piece of an assembly district that created a separate ward and a separate reporting unit in a municipality because the state legislature followed a road line instead of the municipal line and we affectionately call it the ditch. So we've created a, a reporting unit that has no people, no residences, and physically it is actually a ditch in someone's yard. So if there's a way to coordinate that and match all of those wards up at all levels, it is much better because otherwise you're sort of stuck with that bit of an error for 10 years going forward. So Wendy, on, on that point, I mean, on, under this proposal, Essentially, I mean, to, to overly simplify this, the legislature is going first and we would develop, you know, our, our local wards based on that. Is that, the, is that the preferable course of action? I can't say that it's preferable, but it may work out to, um, it may work out practically better um, if they are sort of being done in tandem. So if the legislature starts, you know, their process at the time that we are working on county and municipal plans, hopefully we can make all of those um, area lines match up a little more cleanly. Okay, that's helpful. Um, Andy, a, a comment from Ellen Denzer. Uh, I have discussed the delay in data with my land information GIS staff who have been through redistricting before along with me. We feel you are overestimating the time needed to redistrict. You are following a time frame, time frame created in statute when redistricting was done by hand. Redistricting is now done using the LTSB issued GIS software. It should move much faster than the time frame identified in the statute. Why not ask the legislature to, de to decrease the time frame for redistricting? I would also suggest that historically, the counties create the initial wards when they create the proposed supervisory districts, which also makes the process move much faster. This is another change the legislature could consider. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good comment. I don't disagree with anything that, that Ellen is saying here. The issue is not so much in the ability to get the actual boundaries drawn based upon GIS data. A lot of it has to do with the public hearing requirements and the notice requirements, and then also the meeting requirements associated with adopting a tentative and final plan. If we need a class three insertion, that's a three week insertion in, in most jurisdictions. That's three weeks that you need just to get the, the meeting noticed where you're going to take up the hearing and then have a meeting to adopt the plan. So. 30, 30, 30 is a really compressed time frame. If, if all 72 counties said, hey, we can do it in 30, 30, 30, we might be able to work with a solution like that, but I don't know that we have consensus on that. I think that's the concern. I believe Ellen has her hand raised. Chelsea, can you unmute Ellen? Can you hear me? We can. Great. So I think I mentioned last time you got we bet that uh, I've been involved in redistricting since 1990. First census, the 1990 census. That one we did it completely by hand. The next time we used GIS, the next time more GIS. 
honestly, it didn't really delay us that much putting in those public hearing notices. It really wasn't that hard. It goes back to my second suggestion, which is if you had the 72 counties create the proposed ward plan, um, it actually goes really, we've done that every single time. We don't, all the way back to when we did it by hand in 1990, we don't wait and just do a supervisory district plan and then send that out and ask the municipalities to do the ward plan. We create the ward plan and then we meet with the municipalities and adjust it as needed. And for the most part, you're talking about the majority of our state that you don't need that much adjustment. You know, it just, you really don't. Um, wards are a lot smaller, local municipalities like our cities. A lot of times they will have a couple of at large uh, representatives and then they'll have a couple of representatives representing specific areas. It provides a lot of flexibility. I mean, we just literally had this discussion just yesterday, looking back on how we had done it before. It moved, you can't, it, literally my G, our land information officer said, quite frankly, I could do the whole state in about, I could do wards for the whole state using this new software from LTSB. He said, it's fantastic. You could do the whole state in a month and a half. You're not talking the problems and the and the struggles and the paperwork and the everything can be transmitted within minutes to local municipalities, GIS, you're talking emails, you're talking things are moving really, really fast. Also, why not ask the legislature, cut down that three week notice, cut it down, cut it down to a two week. I, I think we have to think outside the box here. Yeah, appreciate the comment. As far as the, the notice requirement, um, we have we have brought that up with with members of the legislature. I think they're they're very hesitant to change any notice requirements as it re relates to to redistricting, given that they want to make sure the public has sufficient time. Um, but that that's something we can we can definitely ask and, and pursue again. Um, I do see a, a note here from Craig Mosier who said the Outagamie County Board passed a resolution last night opposing a compressed timeline. Um, essentially anything less than the 60, 60, 60. Uh, Kara Holman has her hand raised, Kyle. Or she did. Hi, this is Kara. I, could I actually pose a question to Ellen just so I better understand where she's coming from? Yeah, absolutely, Kara. So Ellen, could you walk us through um, how you get from the public hearing to county board approval? Because I know in counties like ours in the past, I believe the public hearing is held either at ad hoc committee or at committee of jurisdiction. Um, and for things to get introduced through our county, it's typically a 30 to 45 day process from when it's recommended. How do things work in St. Croix? I just want to better understand. Yeah, it works the same way. Everything that comes to the county board must through, come through a committee. Ever since, I don't know that they'll do it this time, but every other redistrict I've been involved with, they created a special subcommittee, redistricting subcommittee. Um, we held the public hearing as required. I believe we actually usually held the public hearing right at the full county board. So it's okay. done faster. And I think that's how you're able to do it quickly. I think historically mm -hmm. we've held it either at ad hoc committee or a committee of jurisdiction. Yep. Um, which is where we need that extra 30 to 45 days, right? Right, except you could change it and have the full county board hold the hearing. Like I said, we always have subcommittees, but the subcommittees didn't hold the hearings. And honestly, um, we have always had a lot of interaction with our municipalities. There's always a few adjustments to the wards, but nothing extensive. And we've also had that situation that was described earlier, where the state legislature made a change, sent it back, said you must readopt your ward plan with this change we're asking for, that kind of thing. We've been through that. It's it. It happens at the end after everything else has moved forward. It's not, um, it, it's the legislature just does it. You have to follow it. It's the rules, you know, the way it works. Ellen, a question for you. You've got, in terms of cities and villages you have in St. Croix, um, yeah. do you have the complexity that a metro county would in terms of creating wards within complex cities that might have? Um, minority populations and other communities of interest, like we might in Appleton or Waukesha or Dane or Brown right. for that so matter? We don't have that, we don't have that situation. Our cities are both, uh, I say both, we have more than one, two, but two of our cities are 10,000 and more, you know, more like about 20. 
But at the same time, we have one city that is split between our county and another county. And we've, that's always been an extra layer of work to meet with them and figure out how to do that because you have two complete separate sets of ward plans and their representatives are different. So that's a bit of an extra challenge. We have, um, each of our communities is growing, but nothing like what you would face with the minority districts uh, or minority representation that you have to watch out for. And I recognize that, but I also know that way more than the majority of the state of Wisconsin doesn't face that issue. It's only a very few areas. So trying to move things along faster um, so that the state could get started quicker in some areas of the state would be, I think, a valuable step in terms of equal representation. From Wendy and Racine, uh, the time needed to prepare the draft maps may depend on how many people are working on them at various levels, as well as the public hearing requirements. This work is not always done by GIS staff. The last time, my office worked with the majority of our municipalities to draft their local ward plans. That's from Wendy and Racine. Um, Andy, uh, the question here, so if I understand, we can go forward with April 2022 county supervisor elections just using the 2010 boundaries and districts. That's assuming we get statutory change based upon this plan. As it sits right now, under the law, we're required to transmit new districts um, based on this on the September 30 release. We can't get that done. We can't transmit new plans. So can you do that? We're going to it's going to require a change in the law in order to get that done. Andy, does the September 30th date and the date for county redistricting to begin the same? Is there a chance we could begin before September 30th? I don't know how you begin without the data because everything that talks about the redistricting process and the commencement of that process, it's triggered by the receipt of the census data. And Andy, what are the factors that need to be considered when drawing boundaries? That's all, I mean, when you take a look at all the factors to be considered, WCA has published redistricting guidance that's available on the WCA's website. And it goes through all of the legal considerations as it relates to drawing those boundary lines. And again, that's available on our website, wicounties.org. Um, I believe it, you can find it under publications. And let me just be, and let me just be clear here too, back to the, the question before. Well, what happens if we do nothing? What happens if we don't have any legislation doing anything? Well, all of a sudden we've missed all of these different deadlines. We've missed all the different deadlines and we're gonna go through a redistricting process after the deadlines have already passed. Well, there's no penalty for doing it that way. There's, there's no penalty. But in our mind, it raises significant questions about all of a sudden do we have a supervisor who is elected in a particular district that was drawn based upon the 2010 census that is no longer in his or her district because of the redrawn district lines, have they vacated their seat? That's a great question. It's an open question. We'd rather not have questions like that unanswered by simply doing nothing. We'd rather have certainty as it relates to who's entitled to what seat, when, and where. Uh, and that's why we're suggesting this approach. Andy, another question, is delaying our redistricting for two years off the table? I don't think anything's off the table. I, I, I mean, Kyle, Marcy, maybe you guys can answer that, but I don't think anything's off the table. Yeah, I, I think, again, I, I'd go back to, you know, we, we need to come up with a plan or a proposal that not only the legislature will support and pass, but also the governor will sign. So. I think whatever you know consensus we can find here, um, then then it'll be it'll be our responsibility to to make sure that that works for the other parties involved. Um, uh, from Ellen, a suggestion: ask the legislature to assign redistricting process to the land information officer in each county. That way, GIS staff will work on redistricting. Um, we'll be interested in, in feedback that folks have on on that suggestion. Uh, Mark Abel's Allison, we have a we have draft data now. Can that be used? If erroneous, can we review a redistricting? Sure, you can do that. You could have done that before, Mark. I, I think that's a good point. You can you can start whatever process you want, but then you have to base the final decision in adopting the tentative plan on the real data. 
I don't see any more in the Q&A. Um, again, if anybody wants or wishes to be unmuted, please raise your hand. Um, but just a reminder, again, we will post um, Andy's kind of timeline on our website um, so that everybody you know, can, can look at that. We'll try to get that up yet today. Um, Let me uh, clarify, a anybody who calls it Andy's timeline, I'm going to scold Kyle. I, I, I like Marcy's timeline better. She's on mute. Um, it's a collective timeline that <laughs> we've all been working on together. <laughs> I mean, I know, I just want to say, and I guess defending myself in this timeline that I, we know this isn't necessarily perfect or that this isn't ideal. Um, but unfortunately we're working with what we were given from the feds, um, with this delay. And so, you know, this is the best, um, I think solution for the worst situation that we've been handed. Um, so we just ask for, you know, your patience and your grace in trying to deal with this um, difficult situation. And, and like everyone before me has stated that, you know, we do have to find a solution that works for everyone, not just the 72 individual counties who all do redistricting differently, but for the legislature as well. I mean, we need their help um, in finding a solution because they too are redistricting um, and so we need their help in obviously finding a solution um, so that they will pass the legislation that we um, hope to get to the governor's desk as well. Uh, we had another hand raised. Chelsea. And he should be unmuted or allowed. Steve, can you hear us? Hmm. While we wait for Steve, Andy, I see we have a couple more questions. Um, first, uh, I would think other states are having the same issues we are. Have we reached out to other states to see how they're handling this? Um, you're correct. Other states um, are, are dealing with the same, the very same challenge that we're dealing with. We have reached out to the National Association of Counties and are, are waiting to hear back from them. Um, in addition, the National Conference of State Legislatures um, has put together some information outlining which states are most affected by this. So um, there, there does seem to be um, kind of shared pain in this. And we will be reaching out, especially to some of our Midwest neighbors to see what, what kind of options or plans that, that they're proposing. Uh, Karis from Onigamia said she agrees with Ellen that the legislature designating that the LIO as the lead would streamline things as this is a com complex task for a clerk to undertake if they don't have GIS training. From another one, uh, redistricting is not just about moving census blocks using the GIS tools, that's easy. Counties and municipalities need to be concerned with the principles of redistricting and the federal law. The proposed timeline is a very good solution to the delayed census data. Andy, that's all I see as of right now. So in terms of next steps, I think it's important that Obviously, tell the association um, either your concerns with this plan, what other concerns need to be addressed, and so on. I, I don't think we're going to find a perfect solution for all 72 counties, but we, what we have to find is a workable solution for all 72 counties. And it's very challenging for me, for Kyle, for Marcy, for Ben to really talk about what will work or won't work, because obviously we're not the ones doing the heavy lifting here. That's all of the clerks the LIOs, the other county officials involved in the redistricting process. So if there are considerations that we ought to be aware of, please make us aware of those considerations. And we'll do the best we can to analyze the proposals, take a look at other interests. I know that the Towns Association, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities are also acutely aware of this issue and are taking a look at potential solutions. We'll talk with them. And we'll just keep along this path of trying to figure out the best solution to an otherwise very difficult circumstance. Andy, a couple uh, additional comments have come in um, from Sarah in Waukesha. The complication she sees with the timeline is that we're starting the process with one county board, having an election, and then ending the process with a newly elected county board. That's a complication. I mean, that's very valid. It, it, we deal with that in counties, maybe not something as important as redistricting, but we deal with that quite a bit. A uh, question here from Polk County. What was the original issue that got the deadlines pushed back to September? Um, 
Marcy, I don't know that we've ever actually received an explanation from, from the Census Bureau as to why the data is delayed. I mean, I think we're assuming the pandemic, but is that is that right, Marcy? Yeah, I think, it, I mean, like everything else, I mean, pandemic and all in everything that went along with the work of the Census Bureau on collecting the data and, and whatever, you know, they're doing with the information and pushing it back out. Um, it's a fair assessment for why it's being delayed. Yeah, and then from Wendy, election management is also a component of redistricting so that you do not create more splits and ballot styles whenever possible, as that has a direct impact on work for workflow and costs for the next decade. I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. I think that's part of the concern. I mean, I know that Bob had a question about, um, you know, having uh, staggered terms for county supervisors. It's an option, but it would require an additional election every year. And that's a, not only just the one election in the spring, but you also have the nomination period. You also have the primary and then you have the spring general. And if you have that every single year, that's just added administration, added cost, added personnel, added responsibility on the clerk. So we're trying to think of all of the various consequences here to any sort of proposed solution, um, which is why it's helpful to have discussions like this. Um, from Ryan Brown, do we have any idea as to when the legislature will have their solution determined? Any deadlines associated with this? Um, the short answer is no, Ryan. I, I think what we're really trying to do right now is come up with a plan that is, um, I guess, acceptable for the entire membership. And then our hope is that assuming the legislature and the governor, um, you know, can both accept that, that we could, we could get this moving relatively quickly. I know that you know, the uncertainty surrounding this is, is causing a bunch of anxiety. So we will move as quickly as we can um, once we have a, a proposal that the membership agrees to that we can forward on to, to, the, to state lawmakers. Chelsea, I see Steve has something in the chat. Can we try to unmute Steve again? Yes, give me one second. Okay, if you unmute yourself now, you should be able to speak. Maybe there's audio issues. Maybe that's why he typed it in. Okay. Um, another question, if the timeline presented is official for counties for the spring 2022 election, what is the recommended legislative action from your viewpoint? Has there been any conversation about delaying the spring 2022 until June or July 2022? Not the most ideal option, but with over a year advance notice might be the only realistic option. Um, you know, we've talked about, you know, the, the delay as an option. I, I can tell you um, there, there is no legislative appetite to, to, to delay the election. You recall that when the governor um, this past or last spring um, attempted to delay the spring election. Um, there was significant legislative opposition to that and and they've indicated to us that that's a non-starter for them. With that, I think Andy, Marcy, unless I missed something, I think we've we've gotten through here. There's a couple more that appeared in the Q&A, Kyle. Go ahead, Andy, and read them. All right, so from Polk County, from what I've been able to gather, the best two options seem to be to get through a faster deadlines to have it implemented before next spring or wait two years. Anything else is going to cause more difficulties down the road. That's when we started looking at this issue, those were the two options that jumped out to us as the most feasible as well. So I think that's right. And then I see from Ellen, perhaps this is a good time to suggest the legislature a permanent change. All elections should be fall elections change the time frame for local representatives and change their election to November. This would address the cost of elections, would give us six months plus to complete redistricting and reduce election costs. Uh, Ellen, that is, uh, to my knowledge, is not something we've talked about, but we'll look, in, we'll look into that and Andy, we'll, we'll see if that'd be, it. and Andy, what's your initial thoughts of that from that? We could do that, it would be, it would be a completely different term of office then for all locals. We would essentially be eliminating all spring elections if we implemented like this. 
I suppose we could do that. We could do that, but I don't know. I don't know first legislative appetite for that, and also I don't know how our, the membership would feel about that. Okay, so I think probably you know I, I guess um, next steps, as I mentioned, in um, about forty-five minutes, Marcy and I will be meeting with with the governor's office to to brief them uh, a little bit of, of, on the issue. Um, but we will post this, um, Marcy and Andy's timeline, we'll call it. Uh, we will post this on our website. We'll get that up there today. And then as always, if you have any additional feedback, feel free to, to give us a call, um, shoot us an email. Uh, again, you know, uh, this is something we only do every 10 years. So, you know, we're no ways, you know, Marcy and myself are no ways experts on this. So um, any information that, that, you know, we can glean from you would be incredibly uh, helpful. Real quick, had a question about judicial elections. Remember, those are countywide. If we were dealing with countywide seats, it, it wouldn't be as big of an issue. Yeah. And Andy, is, is it correct that all the fall elections are all partisan elections as well, right? So we have to deal with right. that issue. You'd have to deal with partisan and nonpartisan. That'd be a heck of a ballot. Okay. And then I guess the last comment here um, from Packer County. My vote is against assigning the redistricting responsibility to the LIOs. We are happy to help, but a lot of us are new as well. Just because the clerks and LIO need to work together doesn't mean it is less efficient. The LTSB software already builds in coordination between clerks and LIO. So that's from Jason and Wapaka County. I love this comment by Ellen Kyle. Think outside the box. I love that. I love thinking outside the box. Problem is, is that we didn't design the box in the first place. If we had an, if we had a hand in designing the box, it'd be a lot easier to think outside it. And we're told in certain circumstances, the box can't change. So I agree with you, Ellen. I, I think that creativity is awesome. And I think we all want to be creative in finding a workable solution. Okay. All right. Well, I, unless we have anything else, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, again, based on the feedback that, that we received, we'll, um, We'll probably have another one of these calls um, in the very near future to, to update you um, with what we're hearing from the legislature and governor, as well as to update you on some of the feedback we've, we've received. So thanks for, for taking time today and uh, we'll be in touch um, as soon as we have more information to share. Thank you. Thank you everybody.